Psalm 22, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were rescued. And you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a man, I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, they shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust me at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there's none to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joints. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. The dogs surround me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They stare and gloat at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, you, my help, come to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the mouth of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Rescue me from the, the, from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go to the pits even the one who couldn't keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. The coming generations shall be told of the Lord, that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. It is finished. We'll be returning to that psalm at the end. But instead, this morning, we're going to be looking at an event that took place about a thousand years after its composition. This morning, we're going to be walking up to the foot of the cross. And from there, we're going to listen carefully to those last precious words of Jesus before he died. The way I'm going to proceed is by first narrating the story of that last day, drawing together the four gospel accounts into one story. Now, you might have noticed how in the gospels 
There are different details mentioned. Um, but this doesn't mean that it's contradictions. No, far from it. It's just that they're based on eyewitness accounts. And different people notice different things. And the different gospel writers, when they're putting it all together, also had their different emphasis that they were putting on different things. And so even if they had all the details together, they wouldn't necessarily have put them all in because they were putting, uh, making their own point in a specific way. And so the Gospels, there's a reason the way that they are. But I do think that it's also helpful to see them all together in one view. So I'm going to narrate through them together. And some of the details I say you won't find in the Bible, but the fact of the matter is there were details because it was a real event taking place in space and time. And so I trust that nothing I say misrepresents what happened on that day. It was nine o'clock in the morning at Golgotha, that is, the place of the skull, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. The Mediterranean sun had only been up for a few hours, but already the heat was rising. Perhaps it was this, as much as anything else, that was stirring up the ire of the crowd that had gathered. A few hours, bef- a few, half an hour before, Pilate, had just, uh, Pilate, the governor of Judah, Judea, had questioned Jesus and found him innocent of the charges that had been raised against him. And so, having done this, he presented him to the rulers, the chief priests and the people, and declared him innocent, saying that he would therefore punish him and release. But the crowd would have none of it. A few voices cried out at first, but like rain, like first drops of rain before a downpour, they gave way to an almighty cry of people in outrage. Crucify! Crucify him! Crucify! Crucify him! Crucify! Crucify him! This was the crowd that had gathered at the foot of the cross, waiting for that fateful moment when the nails would be driven through the victim's hands and feet. And then the hammers fell. Even some of those who had jostled the way to the front of the crowd turned their faces away in horror, swallowing back a sudden rush of cold nausea. And then the soldiers lifted up the cross with Jesus on it, high above them all, bloody, naked, and bruised. A hush came over the crowd. But Jesus lifting his gaze over them all, rose his voice, clear yet fostering. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But the crowd couldn't bear this. Their anger, quietened for a moment, burst out afresh in a tenfold heat. What outrageous thing for him to say, a criminal, now continuing his blasphemy. They started shouting out, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God. If he is truly who he says he is, come down from the cross, that we might see and believe. The soldiers joined in too, saying, If he is the king of the Jews, if you are the king of the Jews, come down and save yourself. As they set to work, putting up the other two criminals who were to be crucified at Jesus' side. But no one was paying attention to those other two, and the rings of the, of the hammers were drowned out by the clamour of the crowd. The shouts went on and on and on. Even the other two criminals being crucified with Jesus scoffed and mocked, saying, if you are truly the Messiah, come down from the cross. In the meantime, the soldiers, having done their duty, divided up the clothes and cast lots for their garments. All this time, Jesus said nothing. Many in the crowd were oblivious to this, but some had stopped. One of these, in fact, was one of the criminals on the cross. 
Instead, he was silent, staring intently at the side of Jesus' face, trying to get another glimpse at his eyes. For just a moment ago, he had seen them. There was something in them that he had almost found terrible and frightening. There was a nobility about them, a dignity, and something else. But it couldn't be, was it pity? But surely not. It was so hard to tell. The rest of his face was all contorted up, grimacing in pain. He was clearly suffering greatly. And yet, in his eyes, just then, Jesus lifted up his gaze, and their, they, their eyes met for a moment. And in that instant, it all clicked. He was who he said he was. Shouts were continuing to come from the other crowd. This was now too much for that first criminal. He couldn't take it anymore. Not now, after what he'd seen, uh, after what he'd understood, though but dimly. And so in immense pain, he cried out, Do you not fear God, for, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing. And he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. After a moment's pause, Jesus said quietly, Truly, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now, during this time, Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene, several other women, and John were gathered at the edge of the crowd. Many had gone home by this point, but many were here still. And over the next hour or so, the crowd continued to dwindle in size, with people either having seen their fill of blood or feeling ashamed at having got caught up in it all. Now, once the crowd had sufficiently thinned, Mary Magdalene insisted that they went their way forward to the front so that they might stand at the foot of the cross. So they made their way forwards. The centurion, they, coming up to the front of the crowd, they saw a centurion, and they begged him, please, let us come through. Here is his mother. The centurion looked over the small group that had gathered, and surveying them with a nod, let them through. So they stepped slowly forwards and were silent. Mary was completely still, John at her side. Here was one she had nursed since birth, the child whom she had seen grow in stature and maturity, the child she loved. And now here he was, hanging, naked, his bones out of joint, his body contorted. What mother could bear to see her son like this? As they stood there, Jesus saw them, and his mouth made an attempt at a smile. Woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. A little while later, it was noon. But rather than the light of the hot sun filling the sky, instead, there was a strange darkness not quite like night, and yet far darker than a dark, stormy day. The air was still. What could it all mean? The murmur of the diminished crowd hushed to a silence, and the next three hours crept by. And then... At the three-hour mark, out of the silence came this harrowing cry, Eloi, Eloi, leva sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The soldiers started, 
What does he say? They asked each other. Perhaps he's calling Elijah. Another ran and filled a sponge with sour wine. Wait, leave him be, the other said. Who knows? Maybe Elijah will come and let him down. Jesus gasped. I thirst. The soldier with the sponge lifted it up on a reed towards Jesus' mouth, struggling to see in the low light. Jesus took a few drops, and the soldier took the sponge back to refill it. But his companion said, wait, I think he's going. All eyes were looking up at his cross. And with one final exertion, Jesus cried out, It is finished! And then, immediately after, in a lower voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that, he bowed his head and breathed his last. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so having placed Jesus <coughs> having placed Jesus' words in their context, I now want to go back and consider <clears throat> each of the seven times that Jesus spoke to hear what he had to say then and also what he has to say to us today. <clears throat> Okay, so first of all, we have, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At this point, Jesus is in immense agony. He'd been beaten and flogged, and now nails have been driven through his hands and his feet. Yesterday, he'd been betrayed by a friend, and the rest of his disciples had abandoned him. He'd faced an unjust trial, and he'd been publicly reviled, despised, and mocked. If ever there was a moment to be filled up with curses and abuse, surely this would be it. But no, in the midst of his lowest, most painful, lonely moments, he speaks forgiveness. Rather than wallowing in self-pity, he looks out in pity on others. How easy it is when you know you're in the right to fail to be gracious snark, snide words slip out of our mouths. How hard it is when you've been wronged to not hold that against other people. I hope, praise God, that he is not like us, for he does not deal with us according to our transgression. He sees us wandering in our sin and ignorance, our self-importance and our self-righteousness, and he has compassion. What incredible mercy. What wonderful grace. For God did not look on a sinful world and turn his face from it. No, he identified with the lost, with you, with me, and he entered into our condition, walked among us, and redeemed us. Perhaps we might look out on that crowd and think that they should have known better, But Jesus' words say otherwise, they do not know what they're doing. Perhaps we might, yeah, in their ignorance, they affronted God and cursed him. And perhaps when we look around today and we see people who want to have nothing to do with God, perhaps even opposed to him, we might be tempted to avoid them and consider them cut off. But the almighty challenge from the cross is that Jesus, being faced with such people, has compassion on them and ask for them to be forgiven. And praise God that he does, for in that crowd were once you and me. And such were some of you, writes Paul, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so while we may have difficulty with forgiveness, praise God that he doesn't have our hardness of heart. For he has a thousand times more reason to not forgive us than we do to not forgive others. And yet he forgives nonetheless. 
perfectly demonstrated at the cross how good it is to know the forgiveness of God. Let us now consider the second saying from the cross. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And for a fuller look at the importance of these words, I'd recommend you find Felix's preaching on that back in October as part of our series on grace, because this is exactly what we find here, grace. The thief recognises his own wrongdoing, that his punishment is justly his. He, can't, he doesn't ex- hope to expect anything from Jesus. Indeed, he had been mocking him only a few moments earlier. And yet... Jesus doesn't hold this against him. This is one of the ones he had prayed for, that they might know the forgiveness of God. Though he had been doing wrong up until the very last hours of his life, yet Jesus receives him and welcomes him home. He's not looking for a reason to turn him away. He holds no grudges. No, it's his good pleasure to keep the door wide open. And the same is still true today. He will not turn any away, though it be the last hour. But do not delay to come to Jesus and receive from the fountain of grace. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And these are words also for us who believe. Never fear that you have done too much wrong to come back, running back to the Father's arms. Sometimes we might feel that it, we ought to be doing better. And if we, so if we sin, we should just not go to God. We might think, if other people knew what we'd done, they'd want to have nothing to do with us, let alone what God might think. But God is not like people, for he knows all, and yet his steadfast love never ceases. Though we fall short day by day, yet his mercies are new each day. Lamentations 3, 22, 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. We now turn to the third saying where Jesus addresses John and his mother. Woman, behold your your son, and John, behold your mother. I feel like commenting on this can only detract from the moment. So I only say this. Beyond his own grief and anguish of spirit, Jesus' heart is towards those he loves, making provision for them in anticipation of his absence. And in fact, there's a parallel for us as believers today. So the day before the crucifixion, Jesus had been talking to his disciples, telling them what was going to happen, how he would be away from them. Then seeing their sorrow, he says, but I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, referring to how he would give them his Holy Spirit. And so just as Jesus, in his last hours, makes provision for his mother that she wouldn't be a destitute widow, so also he makes provision for his disciples that they would not be abandoned orphans. And one other thing to notice. In John's Gospel, John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so we can see here that Jesus wanted the very best for his mother. There was no one better he could have asked to take care of her. And so also with the giving of the Spirit. Jesus even said it was better that he went away that he might give the Spirit. For the Spirit of Jesus is not limited to be in one place at one time, but instead he is present always, at all times, with his disciples, dwelling within. He cannot be any closer. Jesus is ever interceding for us. His thoughts are towards us, and he is urging us on, encouraging us by words of encouragement through his Spirit. But now seated in authority in heaven at the right hand of his Father, he has not forgotten us. And he is eager for the day he will return to be again with his own. Truly, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He made the best provision for those he loved in those last hours of his life, and still today he is constantly <coughs> providing for us, his beloved. Let no lie take us hold that he is uninterested or ambivalent, that he grows tired of us. No, at all times we have a joyful audience with the king. Okay, the next three sayings I want to look at together because they're related. So first we have, Eloi, Eloi, Salema Sabachthani. We have, I thirst. And then finally, it is finished. The first is surely one of the bleakest cries ever to be made. The Son of God, who had existed in eternity with his Father, and even while he was on earth said that he and his Father were one, now felt for the very first time that his father was absent. And so just as we've been th- reflecting this morning, as John shared about looking through our lives and seeing God even in the bleakest of moments, just I say this to you that there is n- no darkness that we can face that God himself has not endured. So i just put that linking in with what we've been reflecting on. And so, grappling to express the depth of his intensity of feeling, he turns to poetry. For those words that he said are the very first words of the psalm that I read out at the beginning. And so often the case, when we're faced with great sorrow and grief, like at funerals, we turn to poetry, because they allow us to speak with words louder than our own. And this is what Jesus is doing here. But it's not just the opening lines that Jesus is referring to. See, notice what the next words Jesus say are, I thirst. And if we turn to the middle of that psalm, Psalm 22, verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue sticks to my jaws, I thirst. And then look to the end of the psalm, verse 31, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. The Hebrew literally is, he has finished it. It is finished. And of course, we also have other references to the crucifixion within here. Uh, We have that uh, his hands and feet are pierced, that his bones are not broken, that there's division of garments by casting of lots, and there's also this bit about scorning and mocking. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. The whole psalm, in fact, is what Jesus is referring to. Because he recognises that what's happening right now is its perfect prophetic fulfilment. So what can we glean from the rest of the psalm? As a whole, it follows a fairly common pattern that we can find in the psalms. It's kind of a, a wrestling with God. And so while they often start with this quite raw, rough, emotional outburst against God, yet by the end they come to a place of recognising God's faithfulness. Even though I feel that God is not here, yet I know that he is faithful. And that is what we find in this Psalm of David's. Uh, So I think it also, therefore, gives us a glimpse into the mind of Christ on the cross. So, just as I said, we start again with an outburst against God. Um, But then after that, we come to this statement of God's faithfulness in the past. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. But this is still a bit absent, it's a bit distant, and it kind of comes across almost as a uh, trying to remind God of what he ought to be doing. And then we turn straight away after that again to the psalmist thinking about what he's feeling, how he's scorned and mocked and despised, verses 6 through 8. And then there's another turn. And yet you are he who took me from the womb. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. So it's now turning from more distant past to more personal past. And this seems more of a reminder of the psalmist to himself of God's faithfulness. Then we turn again to outward circumstances about being poured out like water, bones out of joints, uh, and the, the dryness of his mouth. And yet... After that, we have this, another turn. But you, O God, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. 
he realizes at this point he can call still on God. And then we have this realization that God truly is faithful. Verse 24, but he has heard when he cried to him. And then we come right to the end and we have those final words, he has done it, it is finished. And here we turn to what Jesus meant by this. What he's saying here is that his moment had arrived. The culmination of his life on earth was now close at hand to make a way to reconcile God to man, to reveal the righteousness of God by his death on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And then close briefly with the last words of Jesus, the seventh saying, perhaps that seven isn't a coincidence. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus, having wrestled in anguish, declares his firm confidence that God is his rock of refuge, that his Father's hands are steadfast and secure. And because of what Jesus did on that cross, we can say the same each and every day until the very last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen.